the skyscraper, the ultimate symbol of power and wealth. But incredibly, to invent the skyscraper, it took To me, good skyscrapers are works of art. They're magnificent on so many different levels, whether it's engineering or just the exterior beauty itself. You cannot believe that these buildings are actually built, that they are so big, that they're so incredible, like something out of a, a dream. The skyscraper, born in America, an invention that spreads across the globe, tributes to ambition, ingenuity, and sheer determination, which also makes them targets. Skyscrapers and disasters, linked from the very beginning. The very first skyscraper rises from the ashes of another American disaster. It's October 8, 1871. And Chicago, the biggest boom town in the world, is on fire. Wooden buildings, wooden sidewalks, even the greasy Chicago River itself all burn. 17,000 buildings are devoured by the flames, and 300 people die. To rebuild their city, the people of Chicago need a spark of genius. They find it in architect William Jenny. The problem with masonry is that the higher a building goes, the thicker the masonry has to be. Six-foot walls mean tiny offices, low rents, and a big no-go from the Donald Trumps of the 19th century. This was one of the great problems that architects and engineers faced. How do you build really tall buildings with thinner walls? His wife Lizzie places a book on a bird cage. And William Jenny sees a future built around steel. He realizes that a steel frame can support the weight of a tall building. There are moments when certain technological developments happen and everything changes. Jenny's invention of the steel frame, moving us away from stone masonry construction, was a paradigm shift. In 1885, Jenny gives the world its first 10-story building. 30 years later, skyscrapers reach 57 stories. And in 1931, the Empire State tops them all at 102 stories. Jenny's flash of genius creates the modern city skyline, transforming the way we live. If Jenny's birdcage brings the skyscraper to life, the Empire State Building gives it everlasting fame. But the world's most iconic skyscraper has its brush with disaster, too. It is July 28, 1945, in the last days of World War II. Until the World Trade Center opens, the Empire State Building is the tallest building on Earth. 102 floors filled with 21,000 workers. At 9.30, Betty Lou takes a coffee break, high on the 80th floor. It was so foggy, just like pea soup. I never saw it that bad before. Less than a mile away, Army Air Corps pilot William Smith is lost in the fog Come in. Come in. and growing desperate. I can't even see it. I can't see anything. Bank left! Bank left! The bomber flies straight into the 79th floor, one story below Betty Lou. 
a burning engine rips through the core of the building. Despite a 20-foot hole in the building, remarkably, it stays standing. Of the 1,000 people working there, only 14 die. And miraculously, amongst the survivors is Betty Lou. I don't think anyone knew uh, if a plane hit the Empire State Building, would it still stand? Would it create some massive shift? Would it knock off the side of the building and then the whole building would collapse along with it? Well, they realized that the buildings were built very, very strong uh, and it could actually withstand something like that. The Empire State's strength in the face of disaster is a testament to the genius of Jenny's design. Disaster and near disaster created and then shaped the skyscraper. But the hunger to grow ever taller now sparks an unexpected new battle. A massive new skyscraper in New York City should be a triumph, but it turns into a disaster and the world's first case of sick building syndrome. The Equitable Building was not the tallest building in New York, but it was massive. It had more square footage of real estate than any other building in the world at the time. It kind of freaked people out in New York because it would cast these enormous shadows. But New Yorkers are outraged. All of a sudden, at the center of Manhattan, you had dozens of tall buildings almost abutting each other, cutting light off the street, and people panicked. The Equitable Building was probably one of the worst examples of kind of pure economic motivation driving a piece of architecture. This building casts a 24-hour shadow on a number of different buildings, thereby creating dark office space in adjacent property. The Equitable's noon shadow envelops six times its own footprint. In 1915, this is new and disturbing. Staff in buildings nearby complain of eye strain. Doctors worry that the gloomy conditions will encourage tuberculosis. And the properties in its massive shadow see their values slump. This was a really big concern of New Yorkers that skyscrapers were going to destroy the city, would it just be that the entire downtown Manhattan would become dark? Suddenly people became aware of this massive megastructures, the fact that we have to sort of control them. We have to make sure that they don't uh, exploit, uh, you know, the, the person on the street or the person working in it. Faced with this nightmare vision of the future, New York's politicians come down hard. It really led to the passage of zoning law in 1916. What that meant was that the taller they got, the thinner they had to get. And it led to the wedding cake shaped buildings that we see a lot of in the city today. It gave birth to the modern skyscraper spire. What they're doing is they're letting light come into the cities. The wedding cake is the early 20th century solution to the problem of darkness in cities. After Equitable, architects come up with increasingly clever designs and shapes to bring in the light. Skyscrapers define the modern city, filling our skylines with ever-changing designs. But what will the next revolution be?